Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. I drink coffee, I talk watches, but not at the same time. I'm too animated, I'd end up spilling it. 300 videos foraging for bargains at the value end of the watch market, and yet today is my first encounter with Parnas. I thought it was high time I picked up one of these for myself, so I moseyed over to AliExpress in search of a GMT. Now the thumbnail says $80, but I didn't pay that. I think I paid closer to 70, and there are heaps of them to choose from. I went for the Black Dial Oyster Bracelet with orange accents. If you like the Pepsi Jubilee look, you're well catered for. If you like the Batman, the root beer, etc., etc., you can even get them with sterile dials if you don't fancy Parnas on your watch. I will obviously leave a link in the description of the video. You can do some foraging for yourself. Yourself. Now this is going to be a very short video for some of you. I'm going to recommend that you stop this one before I even flip the camera. If you want a watch that doesn't cost an awful lot of money, but looks like you paid much, much more money for it, buy a Parnas GMT. Honestly, press pause on this video, click the link, buy one of your choosing and live happily ever after. I cannot remember another watch that I have reviewed that plays such a fantastic Jedi mind trick on the user. It looks so much more expensive than it is. It looks fantastic. So off you go, press pause, click the link, buy a watch, be gone. You still here? It's not all about the looks, is it? So that's the question today. Does this Parnas have the go to match the show? Let's find out. So what are we going to do with the Parnas GMT for you all today then? Well, all the usual good stuff that I incorporate into reviews, there'll be a loom video. I'm gonna pop this one on the time grapher, wrist shots, high, low, inside and out. I'm also going to discuss a number of compromises with this one. It's incredibly specced on paper, and as I discussed in the introduction, I think it looks sensational for the money, but it's not without compromises. And I think you should hear about them, full disclosure, before you jump on the Parnas bandwagon and order one of these for yourself. So not a Rolex Submariner ripoff today, more a ripoff of the GMT Master 2, but dimensionally they are very, very similar after all. 40mm in diameter, 13.6mm thick, 47.5mm lug tip to lug tip, 20mm lug width, tapering down to 155 back up to 185 at the Parnas branded clasp. Sized up for my 7 inch wrist, this one comes in at 147 grams. If you're familiar with this type of watch, that is pretty much on the sweet spot. Every single one of those dimensions, aping Rolex and every single one of them pretty much spot on. 316L stainless steel case, crown, bezel and bracelet. Now we have solid end links on the bracelet. We have solid links and we have screw links. I was simply not expecting screw links in a watch at $75. And the clasp, as noted, double pushers on the side, slightly unusual, but it's a proper scissor clasp as well. Again, slightly different in format. I'll talk about that a bit more later on, but it's a solid feeling scissor clasp with three micro adjusts. That is a piece of flat sapphire crystal. And as you probably already spotted, that is a glorious, shiny ceramic bezel insert, which in my humble opinion, makes all the difference. It really sets off the watch. You can put a ceramic bezel insert on a cheap watch and it suddenly looks like a much, much more expensive item. Now, unidirectional rotating bezel. Bezel action is actually pretty good. 120 click. Now, in this case, we have a proper GMT movement in here. I'll play around with the movement in just a second. The fact that the bezel rotates mean that you can actually set up a third time zone. So you can track home time with the three hands, second time zone with a fourth hand and a third time zone if you're clever about it using the GMT bezel. Now the bezel itself is a little thicker than one might expect. It's certainly a little bit chunkier than on some other Submariner style homage watches that I own, but it's not a bad thing. Nice and grippy, certainly easy to operate. No complaints at all about the bezel action for the money. 
Case finishing is fantastic for the money, I must say. Those lugs, nice and smooth. Those lugs are better than the Squally 1545 I reviewed last year. Bezel nicely machined. They do a reasonable job of the brushing between lugs and the end link. Nice bit of polish on the side, pretty simple, and you get a parnice, the parnice P on a screw down crown there also. Zoomed in on the dial, it's all simple, legible, and nicely done. Printed dial with parnice, GMT and automatic, they haven't over cluttered it. We've got applied indices, the triangle at 12, batons at six and nine. The Cyclops does a pretty good job of magnifying the date window, which is what it's there to do after all. Circular indices everywhere else and a simple minute track printed around the outside edge of the dial. Handset is fairly flat, not beveled, fairly simple, but nicely cut, no rough edges. Again, very, very impressive, all clean and tidy for the money. So I'll talk about what the movement actually is in a couple of minutes, but first of all, let's talk about what it does. Screw down crown. Now, as I suggested earlier on, this is a proper GMT automatic. Fully independent fourth hand that rotates once every 24 hours. Now, pop the crown out, this movement will hand wind. Quite a gritty hand wind, but there it is if you rotate the crown clockwise. One more pull of the crown to the second position, and it has a dual function. Now, if I roll it forwards clockwise, it'll adjust the date. If I roll it backwards, it will adjust the independent GMT hand. So 6 p.m. in Australia, let's set it to GMT. 6 p.m. here is 9 a.m. in London at the moment. So I will swing that one round to 9 a.m. And there it is. So you're lining that up with the outer bezel, assuming you've got it set vertically. One more pull and you're into the home time adjustment. And as you can see there, the GMT hand is rotating in unison with the home time. Again, just pretty incredible that you can get this much movement in a watch for about 75 bucks. Oh, and I should add, it also hacks. So that's what it does, but what actually is it? Well, the movement contained in this watch, I've seen it labeled as a Mingzhu DG3804B. DG meaning Dixmont Guangzhou. So clearly a Chinese source movement. Uh, some of the wisdom of the internet suggests that it's ETA based. Uh, some suggest that it's Miota 8000 based. That seems much more likely to me, given that this one has 22 joules and is unidirectional. It winds only in one direction, again, which I'll talk about later on. So let's see how it performs on the time grapher. Beat rate automatic, lift angle 52, which is, I, I guess, a reasonable compromise for this one. Let's start the bleeper. Now that is not bad at all. Hovering around zero, you'd take that from a $70 watch, wouldn't you? And look at it, it looks fantastic on wrists. I think, as I said, that ceramic bezel insert really does make all the difference. It's nice, it's crisp, it's cleanly done. Even the brushing on the bracelet is pretty good. Not sure about that parness in the kind of fancy script there, landscape style on the class, but I'll forgive it. I can forgive this one a few of its foibles and idiosyncrasies, considering how good it looks for how little outlay. I would have preferred if it was half a mil thicker. It does sit up just a touch, the case back protrudes, but there's a reason that Rolex have been making this case design for pretty much the last 50 years is because it's great. Super, super comfy. Again, the bezel is a little thicker than I might have liked, but I'll forgive it at the price. Looks good outside in some natural light as well. I don't imagine there is much AR coating on that glass, but it's still pretty legible. You know, these dive style watches with the classic Submariner indices are always pretty good, always pretty easy to read. And I do like the GMT hand. I love the way they've color matched the orange on the script on the dial with that orange on the hand. Very, very nicely done indeed. Wears well as discussed. Not a huge amount of curvature to the case, as is the Rolex way, but it is comfortable when you've got it on wrist and when you've got it sized properly. Okay, Jody, this all sounds great. Dish the dirt. Tell me what the compromises are that I'm going to have to cope with if I do want to get one of these Parnassus on my wrist. Well, let's look again at this clasp. I mean, good on them for putting something that isn't just a press clasp. 
but it sits rather weirdly. I mean, there's a nice bit of curvature to the back end as one would expect, but the front end kind of sits high and juts out. Today's control is my favourite current budget Submariner homage, the Loreo, and you can see a much more even distribution of metal under your wrist. So you do get a little bit of a kick up from the clasp on the back end of the watch. It's not super noticeable, it's not a deal breaker, it's just a little bit odd. And the loom, perhaps unsurprisingly, is pretty dreadful. I've never found a dive style watch for under 100 US that has had half decent loom, and I still haven't. It actually hangs on better than you might expect, but it looks dreadful. It looks really, really bad on the indices. Hands not bad, but the indices look terrible. It looks like they got bored and just gave up before they'd even done the job. And what have I not talked about? Water resistance. Here's the L'Oreal back again, proudly advertising on the dial 200 meters. Parnas, water rating notable by its absence. That's because the Parnas is rated at only 30 meters. Now that is splash proof at best. So it's a dive style watch that you certainly shouldn't be taking diving. Which is a bit surprising given that the crown is screwed down and the case back is also screwed down. So you're getting a bit of a picture here that the build quality of the Parnas isn't perhaps as good as it could be. And then there's the Sapphire Crystal. Now if you're a regular here, you know that when I get one of these Chinese specials in and it claims to have Sapphire Crystal, I get out my state of the art as used by NASA Diamond Selector 2 and I test it to keep them honest. Now what have I got here? Seiko with hard legs, Parnas with sapphire, and the bicolor Oris 65 that definitely has sapphire. So let's see the results then. Not a flicker from the Seiko as one would expect. Parnas, five bars. Oris, seven bars. Now I've never had a result where the Chinese special has had such a discrepancy with a Swiss watch that I know utterly 100% has sapphire. And I can't quite explain it. Perhaps it's sapphire coated mineral. Perhaps it's just really thin. I'm not too sure what's going on. Please leave me a comment if you can shed any light on it. And the old Mingzhu DG3804-B, as accurate as this one is, it's pretty rough. Unidirectional winding, you give this watch a spin, and the rotor spins, and it spins. Still spinning, I can feel it, I can hear it. And it stops. It spins in a way that the Miyota 8215 spins, and that is a movement that I don't have the best relationship with. The crown action is also a little bit dodge. You know, it doesn't always pop out as you want it to. And sometimes when you try and engage one, you engage the other. So it's a little bit rough and ready. Not always easy to get it to screw back in as well. Hang on. Oh, I can just edit this bit out. There we go, there we go. I'm not gonna edit it out. It's proved my point exactly. So I think I have presented this Parnas uh, fairly openly and honestly. Honestly, it looks sensational. It looks as good as watches costing two, three, four, five times the price. It really does look fantastic. And on paper, the specs are sensational. Automatic GMT, stainless steel bracelet, solid end links, screw links, sapphire-ish crystal, and a ceramic bezel. $75, $80, pretty amazing. But, and there are buts today, but that sapphire may not be as durable as some other sapphires that I've encountered. Build quality, perhaps not up to snuff. And the movement, as accurate as this one is, is a little bit rough and ready. And if you don't like to feel and hear the watch on your wrist, then you're probably not gonna get on well with the Parnas long term. So this one goes back over to you. Depends really what you're after from a watch, bang for buck and show, or build quality, durability, and go. So there you have it, long overdue, finally a Parnas on the channel. I think I got pretty much what I was expecting here. I got a watch that looked great on paper, fantastic set of specifications, 
More than that, it looks great on wrist. I'll say it again, this looks really, really good. It looks much, much more expensive than $75, $80, whatever you're gonna pick one of these up for on AliExpress. But there are some question marks about the construction and the overall durability. The fact that they don't rate it as water resistant in any way, shape or form suggests that perhaps they're not as well screwed together as some of the other uh, Submariner homages for under 100 US dollars. So I guess it's up to you then. What's important to you? What are you gonna be using this watch for? If you want something with genuine Thule versatility that you can take swimming at the weekends, uh, buy something else, don't buy one of these. But if you're a desk jockey, if you're an office guy who wants something that looks great and doesn't cost you a fortune, definitely I can see strong appeals in the Parnas. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one.